Welcome to the September 2008 Public Forum uh, Debate Czar Briefing. This first briefing is only going to deal with the historical aspects of the resolution. Overviews and political commentary and analysis of the resolution will be held off until the next briefing, which should be out shortly. Let's talk about the resolution and the historical concept. Uh, the 2008 September resolution is resolved that the United States should implement a military draft. To understand this clearly, let's look at the history behind uh, this resolution. And let's, of course, start with the American Revolutionary War. There was no federal conscription of soldiers during the American Revolutionary War. However, there was a state conscription of soldiers in each individual militia. If they didn't have enough manpower, the soldiers would be conscripted from the local states. This ended, obviously, with the end of the Revolutionary War and the reduction of the American military. The American military model has always been a small, professional corps of elites trained at West Point, Annapolis, now the Air Force Academy, uh, who would then be the backbone or the spine of the military. And in times of crisis, those ranks would swell in the enlisted soldiers, and uh, they would uh, be trained by uh, longtime uh, non-commissioned officers or by officers. They, those would be the structure of it. And, and that's really worked ever since. Uh, but the draft has been used to swell the numbers when necessary. There was no federal draft in the War of 1812. However, in the Civil War, uh, both Abraham Lincoln uh, instituted in 1863 and Jefferson Davis in 1862 a military draft, which was highly unpopular. Uh, the New York riots, as found in the movie Gangs of New York, would be a prime place to look to get a historical perspective. Uh, but even though there was such uh, resistance, uh, only 2% of the draftees uh, 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 of the soldiers who served in the Civil War were draftees. Now, Six percent were what were called paid substitutes. If you were wealthy enough, you could pay the money to have to the federal government and someone else would take your slot. Very important concept that we'll talk about in the next uh, briefing on the philosophy behind the military draft. Now, the military draft ended obviously at the end of the Civil War. And the conscription, however, the military draft was reinstated at the beginning of World War I. There were massive protests against the military draft from socialists, communists, uh, and blacks, uh, because the poor seemed to have a disproportionate uh, representation. More on that in the next briefing. The federal government was given broad powers uh, to crack down on opponents to the draft and uh, certain um, socialist leaders such as Emma Goldman and uh, Eugene V. Debs were uh, jailed for suggesting resistance to the draft. Uh, after World War I, the draft ends, the military uh, depletes itself to a small numbers again. But with the growing uh, tensions that were seen in the European and the Asian theaters in World War II, Military draft was reinstated in 1940 for a 12-month hitch, unless during a time of war. There was a built-in clauses and duties for conscientious objectors. Those who uh, didn't uh, believe in violence uh, were given, still, uh, they were drafted, but they were given positions, usually pretty dangerous positions, such as being a medic in the front lines or a corpsman uh, in a mobile field hospital really quite dangerous positions for the most part. Now, conscription ended after the uh, World War II uh, in 1947 when the act ran out, but oddly enough, the act was reinstated in 1948 because of the Cold War, the concerns of the uh, growing uh, tensions with the Soviet Union. However, between 1948 and 1949, only about 30,000 uh, people were drafted. The Korean War, we saw a swell from 1950 to 53, where 1.5 million were drafted, 1.3 million volunteered. Now, the volunteers could join the Navy or the Air Force. The draftees were generally in the Army, so it was a lot safer to, to enlist. Uh, and it was a necessary view by many military historians that the surge was necessary to turn the tide of the Korean War. Now. After the Korean War, 1954 to about 1963, we have 
uh, a time of the peacetime draft. The draft was still in place. Now, of course, there was less emphasis on manpower at the time because we weren't engaged in any active conflicts, and the Eisenhower, President Eisenhower had his doctrine of massive retaliation, that the concept that uh, it would be more missiles and less uh, men. However, the draft still existed, and as the head of the draft board, who uh, oddly enough was the head of the draft board from uh, 1940 to 1968, uh, uh, General Hershey stated that for every man drafted, three to four more were scared into enlisting. Now, there were deferments built in at this time for college or for family. So as a result, the draft was part of social engineering to encourage more people to go to college, to encourage more people to have families, uh, and therefore avoid the dangers of the draft. Now, in Vietnam, things changed, 1964 to 1975. However, the number of draftees were still limited. 2.2 million were drafted, but 8.7 million volunteered. Well, there was a huge glut of baby boomers, those who were born after World War II, who were coming of military age at this time. So we had a huge uh, population uh, that were uh, really uh, eligible for uh, military service. Now, Vietnam was, of course, an unpopular war very similar to today's war. The affluent went to college. They got deferments. There were uh, doctors there who were specializers who could specialize in finding uh, reasons for military deferment. Increased diagnostics uh, sciences allowed uh, many of the uh, people who could physically uh, serve in the military were found to have uh, diseases or maladies that would prevent them from military service. However, to get one of these specialized doctors it took money. Harvard University had draft had a a, a a discipline of draft counselors and draft lawyers who would help people uh, fight the draft. Um, of course, for money. Um, for the basic, you know, they, they would be contracted professionals. Furthermore, you also have the, uh, uh, the military deferment for uh, uh, college. That's why so many colleges had their, uh, their numbers increased during the Vietnam War, and a number of colleges just almost sprung up overnight. With the end of the Vietnam War, these colleges went away. Now, the concept there is that the affluent went to college while the poor and the African Americans, socioeconomic and race has always been tied together, were drafted. Most of the protests, however, at this time were on college campuses more than anything else. One could argue it's the uh, liberal college professors, but really the biggest argument for the draft, uh, uh, the, the protests against the draft and the war were people who were looking after their own best interests, college students who knew that eventually they would graduate college. In the 1968 campaign, President Nixon, of all things President Nixon, promised to end the draft for two reasons. One, he saw the effectiveness of the all-volunteer force, and he also believed that this would end college uh, protests. The draft ended on December 1972. From 1975 to 1980, we saw the all-volunteer force. Military uh, developed the importance of recruiters. Recruiters became super important then. Uh, and incentives were created. Uh, college education, travel, military pay were increased. So it would be seen as an option for those either who couldn't afford college or as a possible career choice. Uh, which was quite a new concept. Uh, the ROTC scholarships increased uh, and television ads were done. The Selective Service Act in 1980 made it necessary for everyone to serve uh, in uh, to sign up uh, for a selective service who was 18 or older. It was a felony puni pr uh, punished by five years in prison or a $250,000 fine though no one's been prosecuted since 1986. However, if you don't sign up for selective service, you have a loss of federal employment and no financial aid for college. That's the end of the briefing on historical analysis. Look for the next briefing, which will deal with the philosophical arguments and putting the frame into the current context.